On the island city of Tarvalon, deep in the bowels of the White Tower, Siane Herriman, Aes Sedai from the White Asia, interrogates Talene Sedai, supposedly from the Green, but actually a Black Asia member. Siane and her friend Pevara from the Red Asia are now working in unison with three other Aes Sedai. They use the Oath Rod on Talene to force her to renounce all previous oaths and re-swear the three Aes Sedai oaths plus an extra one to make her obey them. They plan to do the same on all sisters needed to root out the Black Asia. They even start suspecting whether Elida herself is Black Asia. In Camelin, Elaine is trying to gather an army to help her hold her position as claimant to the throne of Andor, aided by Lady Dylin, head of another Andoran noble house, when Masrim Taim interrupts to present demands on Elaine. She reminds him that, since the Black Tower grounds are located on Andoran soil, all the Ashaman are subjects of the Queen, and will have to submit to regular inspections by Elaine, from time to time. Before Taim can complain too much, an Aeol wise one comes and summons Elaine to another room in the royal palace, where she has to perform a ritual ceremony alongside Avienda. The ritual, called the birthing ceremony by the Aeol, is made through the use of Sidar in such a way that makes Elaine and Avienza feel as they were both again in the womb and born again as twin sisters, thus creating a bond between them as first sisters, linking them in a similar way to that of the water bond, albeit weaker. In the Black Tower, Tavin Gazal, the former leader of the expedition sent by Elaira to strike down the Ashaman, meets Gavrel Sadai, another sister. Both are now bonded to Loghain as warders to him. To Vilaira to strike down, they begun to share Loghain's bed to try and learn any secret useful to the White Tower. Together, they begin to plot how to escape. Meanwhile, Rand sets off from Kyrian with Min in his quest to cleanse the taint from Saedin. He carries the access keys to the huge Sa Angreal statues with which we've been torn to the whole series so far but he doesn't know how to use them yet. In Gildan, we left Perrin trying to convince Masima, the Mad Prophet, to follow him to meet Rand, which he accomplished, but Masima refused to travel through a gateway opened by Ashaman, since he states that the only person allowed to use the One Power is Rand himself. So, after agreeing to escort Masima in the traditional way, Perrin goes back to his camp, where he receives the news that Fa'il has been taken by the Shido. Overtaken by rage, Perrin orders many scouts to track down the captors. The first to come back are a group of maidens who found Fa'il's clothes, proof enough that she has been taken, but is still alive. The maidens point to the southeast as the direction the Shido went, and they warn Perrin that they also found signs of shunts and creatures that way. On top of that, at that same moment, the Prophet arrives with thousands of his followers, and after learning of Fa'il's kidnapping, he announces that he will follow Perrin. Despite all of these setbacks, Perrin orders to march after the Shido, even if it means going alongside Masema's madmen. Meanwhile, Fa'il, Aleandri and Morgase are hard-pressed to march through the snow, naked and barefoot, which makes them collapse, after which they have to be carried by a yeoman until they reach the main Shido camp, where they are healed by Galina Kasban, the Aes Sedai who has been made servant. There, Sebana meets them and gives them white robes, making them Gai Shane. A short time later, they are approached by Therava, the wise one that hates Savannah the most, who offers them help to escape, if they spy on Savannah. But after she leaves, Galina comes and also offers them help to escape, but in return, they have to steal the oath rod used to make her a servant from Therava's tent. Fa'il is then left wondering what's the best option to escape. Elaine has to deal with the 29 Sultan and 5 Damani ran captured and brought to Camelin after his battle against the Shontan in Altara. The plan is to show the Sultan that they can channel the One Power as well as the Damani, which has the potential to shake up the whole Shontan society. A short time later, after suffering an assassination attempt that left Elaine and Lady Dylin injured, she agrees to form a bodyguard corps made of women, 
a queen's guard, which she can now fund with recently found alum deposits in her estates. At the head of said bodyguard, she puts Doyle in Mellor, the guard that saved her from the assassins. But, unbeknownst to her, it is revealed that all of it was a setup, and Mellor's true name is David Henlon, a dark friend in disguise who wanted to be put exactly as the leader of the Queen's Guard to serve as a spy. Elaine and Nynaeve meet Egwene in Teleron Riyadh and they comment on the attack on Rand in the Sun Palace of Kyrian that took place at the end of last book. Nobody knows for sure where he is now, but just in that moment Rand travels to the royal palace in Camelin, disguised as an old man, looking for Nynaeve. He wants her to keep the access keys for a time, but she insists on going with him. But before they can take off, Min arrives to Nynaeve's rooms, bringing Elaine and Avienda with her. Rand confesses his love for all three of them, and they tell him they want to bond him as their warder. After some initial reluctance, he agrees, so they go to Elaine's room to weave the bond, and immediately after, Min and Avienda go away supposedly to talk and know each other better, but actually to give Rand and Elaine some privacy, because, you know... Sex! At that moment, Min reveals she had a viewing about Elaine being pregnant of Rand's babies. The next morning, Elaine wakes up to find a note written by Nynaeve, saying that she had to go with Rand on his quest to Glen Saedin. But Elaine has no time to rest, since she finally decides to go to the Borderlanders' camp to the north of Andor, where the four rulers of those nations sit with huge armies. Elaine makes a deal with them, they will come to Camelin and she will direct them to Rand, but as she comes back to the palace, she receives the news of four other armies coming from the east, totaling 20 to 30,000 strong together, so she begins to usher orders to withstand the siege. In Kyrian, Katswain receives an Ashaman with healing knowledge was able to heal one of the Aes Sedai stilled by Rand at Dumai's Wells, and now plans to heal them all. But on the other hand, she also receives the news that Alana Sedai suddenly collapsed unconscious, probably an effect of Rand being bonded by Elaine, Avienda and Min. Katswain knows there is nothing that can be done to help Alana, but wait. Meanwhile, near Sheol Ghul, Several of the Forsaken gather to discuss Rand's plan to cleanse Saedin. They are worried, so Moradin orders them to find and capture him, and, if necessary, to kill him. In the Sea of Storms, the main bulk of the Shantan fleet finally arrives to the Westlands. Hundreds of ships approach Ebudar, bringing the full might of the Shantan army, composed of men and even Agir soldiers, but also thousands of commoners, traders and craftsmen since this is not only an invasion, but also a full-scale reclaiming of the Westlands and a resettling of the Shanton people. Most important of all, Tuon Pendrag herself comes, the heir to the Empress, holding the title of Daughter of the Nine Moons. In said city, we finally see Matt again. He's still recovering from a broken leg after a wall collapsed on top of him at the end of A Crown of Swords. He's been meeting with Aludra, the last remaining member of the Illuminator's Guild, the ones famed for producing fireworks. He's been trying to find the secret of the fireworks to use it as a tool for warfare. On the way back to the Tarasin Palace, he's attacked by the Golem again, who has orders to kill Matt, but he is saved by a rugged old man that presents himself as an old Charon, and in retribution for saving him, Matt takes him to the palace, giving him a place to sleep after which he goes to Queen Tylen's rooms, where he finds her having a meeting with High Lady Surath and Tuon. After an exchange of words, Tuon examines Matt closely and quickly offers to buy him from Tylen, but the Queen answers that he is a free man and thus she cannot sell him. Matt doesn't pay too much attention to this, since he is worried about the dice he feels rolling in his head whenever something big is about to happen to him. The dice have been rattling the whole day, but they stopped dead when he stepped into Tylen's room, and he doesn't know what to make of it. Of course, he's unaware that Tuon, the girl he has in front of him, is the foretold daughter of the Nine Moons. When Queen Tylen goes away on a tour through Altara with High Lady Surath, Matt sees the chance and plots the escape from Ebudar along Tom and Joylin. 
when he gets entangled in trying to free three Aes Sedai from the Shonchun, and it even gets more complicated when Tuan begins stalking him, seemingly bumping into him in every corridor of the palace. But luckily, he is found by Egyanin, the Shonchun officer, who also needs to flee Ebudar, since she's under investigation. So they craft a plan together in which Egyanin will provide Suldom and some Aiden to make the Aes Sedai pass as the Mani. But the plan goes awry when Tuan herself walks up to Matt when he was just leaving. She attacks him and they fight until Noel Charin appears from behind and grabs her. They have no choice but to tie her up and when Egyanin finally brings the Aes Sedai along the Suldom, they all fall to their knees and that is how Matt learns he just tied and gagged the daughter of the Nine Moons. He states out loud what was foretold, that she will be his wife, and Tuan smiles as if she knew some secret about it. Concurrently, Rand had gone with Min, Lan and Nynaeve to the city of Farmadding, where he looks for the Ashaman traitors that tried to murder him at the end of the Path of Daggers. He fights one of them, who ends up dead, and one of the others is later killed by Slayer, a mysterious assassin that already appeared in the Two Rivers previously. After a few days, he receives an anonymous letter, revealing the place where the other rogue Ashaman are staying, so Rand takes Lan with him to confront them, but finds them already dead, killed by Padan Fane, who was the one that sent the letter. Fane is still there, so he fights Rand, but the noise of the fight attracts the attention of the people nearby, so Fane flees again. Rand, who tried to escape through the roof of the building, falls with Lan to the alley, three stories below. When he awakens, he gives in to despair, for he finds himself prisoner again. But, luckily for him, Katswain had followed him into Farmaring with some of the Aes Sedai sworn to him and a couple of seafolk women. Warned by Min of Rand's situation, Katswain is able to trick the ruler of Farmaring into freeing him, after which he asks forgiveness for the way in which he treated Katswain, and she, in return, agrees to step in as his advisor. Immediately after, Rand announces his plan to cleanse Saedin and takes Katswain and her retinue to Shadar Logoth, where he intends to use the Chodan Kol, the two Sa'angriel statues that allow channelers to get access to amounts of the One Power so huge that can be felt all around the world. Rand, linked with Nynaeve, tap into the male Chodan Kol, which can be seen glowing in Kyrian, and the female one, located on the island of Tremolking. As soon as they begin transferring Taidin Stains into the cursed city, the Forsaken show up and the battle takes place. I've already made a breakdown of said battle, so if you're interested in the fate of the male half of the One Power, click the link I'm showing above right now. Winter's Heart ends with that scene, so there are only a couple things left to say. We've seen how the Shonchan are despicable, but this book also showed how they are just in their own way treating nobles the same way as the lowborn in terms of the law, and how they made the lands they conquer prosperous for the common people. That's some well thought world building by Jordan, adding many layers to an enemy faction like the Shonchan. And lastly, it seems to me that Rand is merging with Luciferin Telamon into just one person somehow, as he gains abilities unknown to him before, like drawing skills and knowledge from the Age of Legends. I'm curious of what will that entail for the ending of the series, I guess I'll have to wait. As always, if you like this content, please like and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.